Uh, welcome to you all. I see people are um, coming in there. And um, I'm, my name is Maeve Me Orahan, and I'm the head of Irish studies. Um, and I'm really pleased to welcome you all today to uh, another in our series of Irish studies um, in our spring summer Irish studies uh, um, series uh, for this year. And um, today is uh, particularly close to my own heart in terms of the subject area, but also the speakers. Um, in that we have uh, <clears throat> three speakers contributing to um, he, she got this air out of the night environments of Irish music. And the seminar was put together to showcase three recently graduated PhD researchers in Irish studies here at NUI Galway, um, Dr. Maliki Egan, Dr. Michael Lydon and Dr. Rory McCabe, all of whom have music culture and music making really as central uh, to their research areas. Um, and in this seminar, then, uh, the researchers will they'll all investigate environments of Irish music using the use of, first of all, noise to signal specific spaces in popular music, space and place in the work and approach of Sean O'Riada, and indeed environment and ethnography on Clare Island. And I'll give a little introduction um, to each of the speakers, uh, a biography as we go through. But of course, um, really, I'll keep those short and keep my comments short, um, given that we just want to get to the seminar itself. Um, I, I would also um, uh, point out that um, uh, this seminar is being recorded. It's also being um, streamed on uh, Facebook uh, through the Moore Institute Facebook uh, page as well. And uh, you'll note um, we're all, of course, uh, uh, Zoom literate at this point, uh, but um, you can, uh, the chat function is disabled for this webinar, but you will be able to input any questions that you have. If you look at, at your bottom um, uh, uh, dock, there's a Q&A uh, function there and you can input any questions that you have. And we'll get to those then um, at the end. I'm also really delighted to welcome here today um, uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Hannan uh, from uh, DKIT. And um, I also have a connection, uh, I suppose, with Annie and indeed with all the three speakers, um, uh, as at some point or other, they were all um, students of mine. So I'm really pleased to welcome Annie um, here today as well. Um, and Annie is a musicologist with current focus um, on popular music and social change in Ireland, particularly in relation to women's rights and LGBTQ plus uh, culture. So I think without any further ado, um, we will begin with our three speakers who will give um, not full length conference papers, but kind of truncated um, uh, papers, if you like, as uh, speaking to environments of Irish music. And we are going to start with Maliki Egan there. Uh, Maliki completed his PhD in 2020 um, in Irish studies here at the Centre for Irish Studies in Galway. And the title of his thesis then, A New Model, Sean O'Reilly, Kjolthori Kulin and Irish traditional music. Uh, he's also taught at the Centre for Irish Studies and his research interests include Irish music and identity, cultural revivalism, social history and social geography of Ireland and indeed his work on local music studies um, uh, is included in publications as well. So I'd ask uh, Maliki to um, uh, share his screen and I would welcome our first speaker. Thanks very much, Maeve, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. It's great to, to have the opportunity to, to meet everyone virtually and have a, have a discussion such as this. Uh, also, for me personally as well, it's great to be speaking alongside Michael and Rory. And over the last few years, we've been working together in the Centre for Our Studies. So it's great that uh, post-PhD, it's one of the first opportunities we're all getting to, to talk and we're, we're getting to do so uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this arena here today. Now, we have, each have a short period, and I'm just going to talk about different aspects of environment and place and the role of place in the work of Sean O'Reilly in the context of my own research. Uh, I might share my screen, so I have a few slides. And I think, there we go. I should be able to see that. So my thesis is looking at the history and the development by Sean O'Reilly of Kyothari Kulin throughout the course of the 1960s. Now, speaking to the title of today's seminar, Environments and Place, 
I'm just going to give a brief overview in the context of a whole variety of areas of the development of Kyoto Rikudan, where we find aspects of place and the different sort of settings and the influence of certain settings in how really shaped and developed Kyoto Rikudan. Now, in preparation for today, uh, I look back at a paper I wrote a number of years ago, it was roughly around the halfway point of my PhD, and the theme of that conference uh, was on environments. Uh, and I was looking back at some of the areas, and I suppose with the benefit of hindsight, I'm able to look back and see at areas that I was looking at then, and also a lot of uh, topics and areas that I had yet to develop. Now, at that point, I would probably have envisioned putting a large section within my thesis on Sean and Ria and environment. Uh, but as I learned over the, the remaining few years, this was an area and a topic that touched on so many areas of the development of Kyoto Rikulin that it just wasn't feasible to, to put it in one section. I had a small subsection in my first chapter, but that really anchored what was to follow and pointed readers towards many of the different aspects uh, that I wrote upon uh, over the following few pages and chapters in the thesis. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was, when we're looking at environment and music and the role of place, these are some of the areas I looked at when I was looking at the role of Sean and Reza. Some of the topics and the questions that I was asking myself in the context of Reza, and of course, in, in the context of other musicians and composers and arrangers. We have this idea of environment of composition, arrangement and acquisition. So this is the type of sense of place that has been put forward. And by the acquisition of particular pieces of music as well from certain time periods. You also have to consider the environment of nostalgia. Uh, is the production and repertoire and music of a musician or group influencing or influenced by the past on the part of the musician or the composer? You also have this interesting relationship between the environment of the performance itself, so by the musician and the setting in which they are performing their music versus the environment of reception. So is there a particular significance for the arena within which this performance is taking place? And these are some of the issues that develop my own uh, exploration of Sean O'Reilly's work uh, and development of Pure Three Cooling during this period. Now, there are two key features that I would have identified when looking at Oriza's development uh, of Kyoto Trikula. And I should just point out as well, when I speak of Oriza's work in the context of today's uh, discussion, I'm talking specifically about his work within Irish traditional music. We know he, he worked across different genres and in other areas, but I'm looking specifically and referencing specifically his work within traditional Irish music. I identified two key features when you think about the role of place in Sean O'Reilly's work. The first would be the role of physical environments. So these are the physical settings and places that O'Reilly himself worked work within, and also the physical settings that he placed Kyoto Rikura within. So the settings within which uh, he recorded Kyoto Rikura and broadcast them, and also the particular settings in which he placed them into to take part in public performances uh, as well. So these are the two key features. The second one would be the idea of place. And this is a really intriguing aspect that I found to look at, and it really touches upon every aspect of the development of course, the Kyoto Rikula. And this is the idea of place. So this is expressed through the music of Kyoto Rikula. It's also expressed in the production of Kyoto Rikula. So you see this in the key areas where we can hear Kyoto Rikula and we witness Kyoto Rikula, those being radio broadcasts, album recordings, and public performances. Now, there are examples of the role of place in all of these. I'm going to focus mainly on the albums uh, in, in a moment, mainly because by looking at the albums, you actually can reference the radio broadcasts and the public performance as well in, in, in a variety of ways. So briefly, before I start discussing in more detail the idea, the idea of place within the albums that Kyoto Film produced, I'll just briefly go through for the benefit of everyone some of the physical sessions and environments or really the work that you see from 1948 to 1952. He worked at Radio Aaron as assistant director of music from 1953 to 1955. He had a brief period in London and Paris in March and April of 1955 as well. Then you really from 1955 onwards, you see the period in which the bulk of Aurelia's output is produced when he takes up his position as director of music at the Abbey Theatre. So between 1955 and 1962, he was living in Dublin, working at the Abbey Theatre, Galloping Green was, was his home address. A huge variety of areas he was involved in and, and, and sectors. I'm just listing two of them there. Kyoto Rikulin, obviously enough, was developed during this period. Also, his 
work and relationship with Radio Aaron and RTE developed uh, extensively throughout this period with a number of projects, projects which he was not involved in uh, when he was assistant director of music. And then the final physical setting that you can identify him working within, of course, is Cork, where he moved to Coulee and then working within UCC between 1963 and his death in 1971. Uh, I've listed there the gaiety, the gaiety referencing the, one, one of the last reforms of Kyoto in 1969. You have other projects such as development of Cork Relay. There are just a few of examples within the time we have to, to discuss here today. So these are the physical environments. But what I really want to discuss, because I think it really is an overarching theme throughout all of Oreda's work and development of Kyoto Kuro, and this is the idea and the projection of the idea of the music and, and the diff various tools that Oreda utilizes through uh, radio broadcast, album recording, and public performances. This is one quote from Michael Tuberley, uh, where he's talking about when Aurelia moved to Cork, that he nearly expected the members of Kultur Kulan to move as well. Now, he said this in a, you know, a humorous fashion. He wasn't make, making a, a serious criticism of Aurelia, but at the same time, it gives you a sense uh, of the way in which Aurelia's direction of Kultur Kulan was very much uh, anchored on a sense of theme that where he was, where he was working from, the idea of where he was working from, that projecting that idea through Kyoto Rikulin and through the performance of Kyoto Rikulin were key and essential to all of this. And of course, you must remember, Oreda did not operate Kyoto Rikulin as what you would uh, class as a standard or a conventional uh, commercial band at this time. It was very much anchored on particular themes, at particular moments, at the, with particular projects. So to, to expand this further, I'm just going to list, these are some of the main album recordings of Sean O'Reilly during this period. You have Rock Rick and Reilly in 1962. You have Kyo and Usul, which was recorded in 1966 and released in 1967. You have Ding Dong in 1967 as well. And then you have that final album, which was a recording of Kyoto Rikun's performance in the Gaiety Theatre, which was recorded in 1969 and then was released uh, in 1970. What's important about all of these albums, and the reason I'm focusing on the albums, is because really it's through the albums that you can see this link between the idea of play has been projected between the music and the repertoire that Horea that chooses for these albums to the way in which these albums are produced and the way in which they are linked as well to radio broadcast and the way in which they were uh, produced. Uh, and also in which some of these albums, particularly Kyo and Lucy, which I'll mention in a moment, are linked to the way in which a sense of place is projected through public performance settings as well. And this is really obvious throughout this all. And what I would also say about these albums is that they, these are what we would now class as concept albums, a term which wouldn't have been in use at the time, but certainly they can be adopted now in looking at them, which these are albums that are focused upon uh, very set themes and look at various settings, all individual themes. There, there, is, there are some uh, items that you could class as the same across all these albums, but each of them have an individual identity and are trying to tackle an, an individual theme. When we talk about concept albums, Adrian Scattle has asserted that through Aurelia's work with Kyoto Rikulin, there was a confluence of a new deliberately artistic form of ensemble traditional music and a calculated approach to the shaping of the medium of the LP to articulate this artistic vision. And this is really key to all of this, this idea of an artistic vision being projected through these albums. As well as looking at this, Martin Clayton would argue, and it's as, I suppose, references many of the ideas that I, I mentioned previously about how these questions are approached. Martin Clayton contends that music is meaningful insofar as it offers perceptible affordances. Elements and structures are themselves imagined by means of metaphors derived from the relationship between the individual and environment. And I would argue that they are, these characteristics are probably most potent through, through these albums as well. If we look first at Rockruff and Rede, this is linked very much to the radio broadcast of the same name by Rockruff and Rede. And the basic premise to the radio series and mirrored in the album itself was an exploration of Gaelic culture by aligning traditional music, songs, the Irish language, and portrait within a single setting, really incorporating that idea of promoting and exploring Gaelic culture or not from Gaelic as a way that it classify itself. So a mixture uh, of recitations, uh, channel singing, and, and instrumental music. So this is a clear tool used by Aretha, used within the radio broadcast and exactly mirrored then within the album recording itself. 
one of the strongest pieces of evidence you can see within these recordings uh, and this idea of place is undoubtedly within Kjorn and Usul. Kjorn and Usul represent a far more concerted effort by Orida to address the central musical idea, that being the revival of the harping tradition and the reintegration of harp music into Irish traditional music repertoire. For this album, there are no recitations or shano singing. Instead, Kjorn and Usul perform a collection of tunes that are linked to a Gaelic pre-colonial way of life. Kjorn and Usul is a concept album that emerges entirely from a set theme and musical idea, that being the music of the harping tradition and its representation on an album that is not replicating a preconceived format from radio broadcast. In this case, the message of the album, rather than the ensemble itself, emerges as a core message by Oreda. So although not linked with many of the radio broadcasts that Oreda was involved in and that which he placed uh, uh, Kjotri Kulum within, uh, the message of the repertoire and the production of this album is key. And an intriguing and really fascinating aspect to this is not, it may not be linked with radio broadcasts, but there is a clear link with performance sessions. Now, Kyothra Kulum were not prolific public performers. I've identified some of the areas or examples of areas where they uh, have public performances within my own pieces. But the one I would really like to mention here today because it's intrinsically linked with Kjorn and Usul. Now, I'll read that. Kjotri Kulin performed uh, within UCC during Oreda's time and position working there, but they also performed at one stage within Trinity College to coincide with the release of Kjorn and Usul. And just mention one article that I found in the Evening Echo on the 16th of November 1967, reporting on a performance uh, by Oreda and by Kjotri Kulin. And it states that Sean Oreda last night presented a concert in the Provost House at Trinity College, Dublin. Any apparent incredulity in a performance performance by a folk group in such a setting is explained by the fact that they were playing not rollicking folk music, but the gracious, highly formalized music of the 17th and 18th century Ireland. So here we have a specific setting which Aurel is and Kjotr Kulin are performing this key idea of place and putting forward the sense of a particular period in time, not only through the album itself, but also through a public performance setting. And finally, Ding Dong is another example, or key example of this. This is a shift towards the rural Ireland, undoubtedly, of O'Reilly's youth. Mirroring O'Reilly's radio series, Flacco on Radio, in which poets were replaced by the Shanaki, Ding Dong contains arrangements of instrumental music and songs that bring some of O'Reilly's ideas full circle, from a reacquaintance with music of the past to a more elaborate treatment of the traditional repertoire. It's an album made up of dance music and songs which reflect the environment of O'Reilly's youth further progression of its thematic development from one album to the other. It undoubtedly one of the key areas in all of this is the re referencing of theme and place across all of these albums. I've tried to give an example of that here in the short space of time we have. I'm happy to expand on any of these areas and certainly on areas that I didn't mention afterwards. I'm conscious of the time uh, so I'm looking forward to listening to Mike and Roy over the next few minutes. Just finishing with uh, an image from Aurelia Fugati at the end there which again is reflective of that sense of place where you're moving from different performance settings to the state of the gaiety at 1969, which was seen as such a prolific moment as well. But again, I'd be happy to talk further about any of this towards the end. So thanks very much. Thanks very much, Maliki. Um, and uh, I suppose really starting us on, uh, you know, this theme of environments, um, I, I've lots to say, but we'll move on uh, to our next speaker. I'm looking forward to uh, discussing more about Maliki's paper at the end, but our next speaker, um, I'm delighted to welcome um, Michael Lydon um, as our speaker. Uh, Michael um, was awarded a PhD in Irish Studies from NUI Galway uh, here at the Centre um, uh, again in 2020. And his thesis then uh, titled Haunting Noises, Irish Popular Music and the Digital Era. Um, his research areas include popular music studies, popular culture studies, sound studies and indeed Irish studies as well. Um, so, uh, Michael, um, I'm delighted to welcome you and please start in your own time. Um, Manny, thanks, Maeve, and thank you very much for the invitation uh, to NASA and to everyone involved today. And particular uh, thank you to Dr. Hanlon for agreeing to respond to the research. Uh, the title of this seminar is, of course, a reference to Seamus Heaney's A Given Note, um, a poem through which Heaney
so the title of this seminar is, of course, the reference to Seamus Heaney's A Given Note, a uh, poem to which Heaney signaled, among other things, the influence of specific environments on Irish music. In the paper we are to deliver, none of us specifically uh, assess Heaney's work. Instead, the given note acts as an appropriate background to which to deliver aspects of our own research that pertains to environments of Irish music. Uh, for my part of this seminar, I will reveal the use of environmental noise by Irish popular musicians in the recording process as a response to some of the creative challenges of the digital era, research that's taken from my PhD thesis, uh, and an article I'm currently working on that assesses intangible cultural heritage and the concept of noise forming a part of that in, 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 in forming Irish cultural identity. So to begin, Jerry Smith asserts that the island of Ireland is full of noises and it behoves the Irish critical community to begin listening to them. And not only the noises that are sweet, but also the ones we are routinely to encourage, believe it or not. In using the term noise, Smith is primarily signaling popular music, with the assertion being this form of cultural heritage is often considered an unwanted or not so sweet counter to the sweet sounds of Irish traditional folk and classical music. Uh, Marie Thompson writes of noise that slips between the different disciplinary fields. It carries through the walls that separate science, acoustics, economics, politics, arts, information theory, and law. In using the signifier noise, I recognize the ambiguity of the term. However, in my research, I examine noise from a primarily acoustic perspective. Uh, considering the use of both media and environmental noise as intangible signifiers of Irish cultural heritage. Thompson in her work also notes that noises, uh, conceptual noisiness means that it often functions as a floating signifier. It can be used to talk about almost anything. Thereby, as a floating signifier, noise as Irish popular music can signal a form of cultural expression often subject to value judgments or perception of Irish cultural heritage, whereas noise as sound is by definition unwanted or judged as unwanted. Uh, UNESCO, in the sixth of 12 ethical principles uh, on intangible cultural heritage, acknowledged that each community, group, and individual should assess uh, the value of its own intangible cultural heritage. And this intangible cultural heritage should not be subject to external judgments of value or worth. I just consider noise as haunting presence in popular music, revealing that far from being unwanted, noise forms an integral part of an inherited meta language of recorded sound. Consequently, despite persistent value judgment, noise persists as an intangible marker of Irish cultural heritage. Uh, I will now briefly outline and create in some detail uh, some of the aspects of media and environmental noise. Damien Kukowski writes that noise to an electrical engineer is not is whatever is not regarded as signal. Yet what I know well from working with sound and music is that noise is as communicative as signal. To define the communicative potential of noise, it is important to consider the two formative categorizations of noise evident in the history of sound production. First, there is media noise, which is a clear recognizable signifier of analog technology and all perceived antiquated modes of sound production and perception. The hiss, clicks, pops, and static, best understood as emanating from devices such as a vinyl record, form as much a part of the history of recorded sound as any sonic component. Uh, Stan Link uh, even suggests that in many ways, noise is the grammar of recording. Noise was always there, but disregarded and dismissed as the illegitimate offspring of the event and its transcription. Despite this, with a preference given to digital technology in an era of technological hybridity, Media noise's presence is no longer assured. Nonetheless, it still features prominently in popular music as recorders have recognized its cumulative potential. The second categorization of noise and the focus of this short paper is environmental noise, or what is often characterized as studio noise. In using the signifier environmental, I assess the origins of this characterization of noise as not uh, confined to a recording studio. In essence, environmental noise are sounds that are picked up by the microphone but are deemed outside of the original signal, or also noise as data that is inserted into recording for specific community reasons. Uh, returning to Kukowski, he notes that noise is unavoidable in any live recording because mics are like ears, they hear everything. The signal they pick, is, pick up is always surrounded by noise. He further maintains that decisions in the analog studio were for the most part permanent. Little could be undone short of starting over because there was no way to move backwards through the process. The sounds you made became your history. Uh, 
Uh, as a result, the mic as an ear records all environmental noise, whether that is a cough, sneeze, shout, or movement, thereafter converting it to tape and history. Samantha Bennett suggests that despite digital technology, environmental noise still persists in popular music. She writes, false and, false and flaws have become embedded in the production process. In other words, mistakes can be intentional. Thereby, it can be stated that recorders recognize the cumulative potential of environmental noise. To further assess the, this cumulative potential, it is important to consider noise's influential place in the history of recorded sound. Jonathan Stern purports that on the basis of their sonic character, sound becomes signs. They come to mean certain things. Technical notions of listening depend on the establishment of this code of, of what is heard but exists without an effective language. And thereupon, for a listener to immerse themselves in the listening experience, they must navigate this meta language of sound and consequently noise. Jose Castaneda uh, claims that noise should be there, impregnating, masking, even ruining the enjoyment of a particular sound, but it certainly changes that sound and meaning. Noise is now part of an ancient uh, sonority. For recordists working with sound uh, reproduction technology in the digital era, choosing to use noise as part of this ancient sonority is a significant factor. Yet in, in doing so, they must assess the influence noise has on the history of recorded sound, while considering it its community potential. In terms of viewing noise as an intangible marker of, of cultural heritage, noise can be understood as a part of a meta language of sound, which facilitates an engaged reception of popular music and music in general, actually. Uh, in relation to Irish cultural heritage, noise as part of a meta language of recorded sound can be subject to national and local cadences when employed by skilled recordists. Uh, Paul Hegarty uh, writes that noise has a history. Noise occurs not in isolation, but in a differential relation to society, to sound, and to music. For that, reason, for that reason, noise as an intangible mark of cultural heritage is subject to historical, societal, and cultural inferences, which in turn can signal our sound national identity. Noise's ability to sound Ireland will be assessed shortly, but at this juncture, it's important to stress the fluidity of noise as a signifier. In recognizing this floating signification, a recordist as a skilled, a uh, cultural practitioner can assess without value judgment the cultural potential of noise before using this noise as an intangible marker of cultural heritage. Robert Strachan suggests that cultural practitioners accumulate a store of knowledge in order to be fluid in the skills, conventions, and histories relating to the cultural practices in which they engage. These knowledges are then put into action in the creative practice. As cultural practitioners, the musicians I examine throughout my research accumulate a store of knowledge in relation to noises, possible cultural uh, signification, which are then put into practice in response to the uh, various creative challenges of the digital and post-digital era. Uh, now, to give a comprehensive assessment of use of uh, noise in Irish music is well beyond the scope of this short paper, but well, now just talk through a few examples. I will also not be able to play the audio for, for, for time reasons again, but we'll just talk through some of the examples. Um, the first of these is from David Kitt's uh, Step Outside in the Morning Light, a track taken from his David EP, Small Moments. The song, as the title suggests, signals Kitt's desire to step outside and enjoy the sunshine. To communicate this, Kit concludes uh, the, record, the recording with uh, an initial use of media noise before a lengthy passage of environmental noise. This begins with the sound of somebody opening and closing door, birds singing, and traffic noises, which signal Kit driving somewhere. Throughout all of this, music can be heard in conjunction. However, the final sequence of environmental noise has no music accompaniment, illustrating the liberation of Kit's he's heard walking and saying, how are you doing to a passerby? The use of environmental noise in this final sequence correlates to Salome Foley's assessment. The noise can be construed as sounding akin to a verb. The sequence in all lasts for one minute and 27 seconds and clearly serves to narrate Kit initially leaving his home before driving to a park and going for a walk in the morning light. In the sequence, noise actions his liberation. Moving away from Kit, the next example I want to briefly consider is from Gemma Hayes' debut album, Night on My Side. Uh, this album uses noise to signal Hayes' spatial ownership, positioning her as a primary actor within the space of production, 
are within this uh, environment of Irish music. This can be heard in the opening track, Day One, which begins with loud media noise in the form of audio static. Next, environmental noise is heard as someone uh, walks across a wooden floor and sits on a squeaky chair. This is followed by someone turning on an electric device before a faint male voice says, we are rolling, which warrants Hayes to begin playing. In its entirety, the 10 seconds of noise can be construed as centering Hayes as the primary actor within the space of recording, gesturing to a listener or primary. Uh, Kathy Davey also has a similar use of environmental noise on Mr. Kill from a self-produced uh, album, Tales of Silver Sleep. Environmental noise is most often positioned at the beginning or at the end of a track, depending on different uh, you know, purposes for, it, for, for the artist, serving different purposes as a framing device often. Yet in Mr. Kill, Davey uses noise in the middle or chooses to, to leave noise in the middle of, of our song. Um, this is evident as she is, uh, as her singing is interrupted by media noise, which requires her to momentarily stop and say, okay, before self-assuredly continue, continuing. This illustrates an interesting confidence in her working space and her, her role as a producer and signals an interesting use of noise by a female recordist and what Paula Wolf uh, marks as a distinctly male domain of the recording studio. A point of interest I further assess in my research in relation to artists like uh, Hayes and also Shane O'Connor, uh, drawing on research by Wolf, Thompson, Bennett and uh, other, um, uh, other academics. Uh, finally, uh, Damien Dempsey is possibly the noisiest uh, popular musician in Ireland, as evident in most of his albums, but in particular the rock he wrote in Dublin. Uh, this, is, uh, this album shows Dempsey as a skilled cultural practitioner, aware of noise's ability to serve as an intangible marker of Irish cultural heritage, thereby allowing him to sound Ireland. Uh, this is evident at the end of the song, The Teetotaler where a chair movement is followed by a short dialogue between the musicians, while in the track, the twang man, a clink of a glass is heard uh, towards the middle of the song. Interestingly, these tracks were recorded in an Irish pub in Lanzarote, uh, Charlie's Bar. Uh, thus the noise coupled with Dempsey's often slurred vocals functions to position the performance in a pub session environment, signaling the importance of this environment of Irish music uh, or this Irish pop session to national and international interpretations of Irish music. In a final use of noise, the album finishes with Madam I'm a Darling, a track which Dempsey notes, uh, the tune at the end just came to the three of us, messing around and dueling. It's a sort of dreamy and gives us a feel of the West of Ireland. In looking to complement the dreamy feel of the West of Ireland and the January he spent in dueling arranging the music for the album, the Rocky Road to Dublin concludes with 11 seconds of noise in the form of waves and seabird calls. Interestingly, a similar use of noise is found on Mick Christopher's posthumously released uh, Daydreaming alongside car horns and um, car arms and sirens. Uh, but in all, the environmental noise in these sequence acts as an uh, intangible mark of Irish cultural heritage, allowing Dempsey to sound Ireland with specific environments of Irish music. Uh, in summary, in this very short paper, I gave a very brief insight into use of environmental noise by Irish popular musicians. But as a final point, uh, Propowski notes that in digital media, if you can point to something, you can usually eliminate it in reference to uh, production techniques. Yet this is proving not to be the case, as Recordis recognizes noise's fluidity as a sonic agent, thereby serving them as an intangible marker of Irish cultural heritage. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, happy to share these slides if required. Thank you, Maeve. Thanks very much, Michael. And um, we're going to move on to our third contributor. And I just remind people uh, that you can use the Q&A function. We have a, a question or two in already. So you can use the Q&A function to add any more questions as you might like uh, as we go through. But our third speaker and final speaker for today then is um, Rory McCabe. Rory um, uh, also undertook a PhD um, in Irish studies uh, at the Centre for Irish Studies within the past year. And his doctoral dissertation presents an ethnographic account of music making and community life on Clare Island in County Mayo. Uh, so um, welcome to Rory and uh, we're looking forward to the final uh, leg of the presenters part of this seminar. Thank you Maeve uh, and 
hello to everyone. It's great to be in the company, virtual company of uh, people again. But I was very enthusiastic when I put this, this presentation together. So I've had to lean it down a bit, like cut a lot, but I'll see if I can use the images that I have set out here. And if they don't match up with what I'm saying, don't worry, they're all from Clare Island. They're all fieldwork images and they relate to what I'm talking about. So first off, I'd like to thank Michael and Malachi for using this image, which you see here as the theme for this, um, this webinar. This is Clare Island looking from the harbor in Runa. Um, today, I'm gonna to discuss environment music making in more concrete terms, looking at how, how the physical environment shapes music and cultural life on the island. Um, so my doctoral work presents an ethnographic account of music and social life on Clare Island, which is a small community of about 150 people off the County Mayo coastline. Here's a tourist map of the island. The ethnography centers on field work conducted in 2017, but includes an historical perspective, which examines the changing context of music making in island life since the 1940s. Through this modern history, the ethnography describes music making as an enduring social process in island life. In this presentation today, I will weave a bit of an overview of my project with some general examples of island environment, and in doing so, hope to describe how the making reflects the experience of island life. So first, a little frame, framing of the ethnographic field. Uh, my research examines music, or music making, as I term it, on Clare Island as a constellation of social and cultural practices connecting all areas of community life in the modern period. This is a net musicological perspective, which considers music as a social process as much as a cultural product. In practical terms, music making refers not only to the sounds produced at an island event, but the entire range of social practice that envelop the performance. Music making incorporates everything from audience behaviors to the ferry journey, which transports musicians to the island. Music on Clare Island is similar to music on other islands, at small communities throughout Ireland. Clare Island performance conventions, genres and social settings find a parallel in ethnographic accounts of music making in North Mayo by Moyek Nipsey, in Doolan by Adam Call, in Tory Island by Lil Solira. Music making on Clare Island differs from these and from all other locations through the particularities of its historical development, its specific set of built resources, and through the particular individuals who participate in island music making and community life. These individuals are in turn shaped by the environmental setting and historical setting of Clare Island. While music, while, while islands may influence artistic temperaments, they do not produce music or any other cultural artifacts. Offshore islands such as Clare Island influence music making in the particular constraints they place on the population. One aim of my research project was to describe in detail the where, why, how, and when of music performance on Clare Island in 2017. Through an examination of people, spaces, schedules, and events in 2017, I uncovered three dominant settings or frameworks in Clare Islanders' experience of music making and islandness. The C is perhaps the most uh, conspicuous and defining framework. It creates the characteristic aspects of isolation in an island environment. Furthermore, marine transport. This is the ferry traveling into Clare Island. This is milk on the ferry traveling into Clare Island. And this is cargo being offloaded from the ferry into Clare Island. Uh, this marine transport dominates all, all physical interactions between islanders and the outside world. The sea, this sea journey is in turn shaped by the cycles of seasonal weather patterns. Together, sea and season have an ever-present role in islandness and island music making on Clare Island. The built environment imposes a second framework on island music making and community interactions. At a fundamental level, the island landscape, here's a, an image from the hill on Clare Island, and you can see some houses scattered in the bottom left-hand portion. Uh, the built-in environment opposes a second framework on island music making and community interactions. At a fundamental, the island landscape with its limited space for construction shapes the built environment. However, buildings also reflect the population size and the economic resources available within the community. 
As venues for music making, Clare Island's buildings represent the interactions between physical environment, the island, and the social body of the community, the, island, the islanders. The possibilities for music making and communal interaction on Clare Island are shaped by the social function of buildings, their associated economic practices, and the size of their performance areas. A third framework in the experience of music making in islanders is the human population and the people who participate in community life. Here's an image from the Community Centre Bar from uh, June 2017. Both seasonal change and the built environment affect this population, but in the 21st century, the local community also includes participants from outside of the island. The music making community of Clare Island includes long term and short term members, from locals to visitors, day trippers. The combination of Clare Island's population buildings and maritime setting imposes a distinct pattern or character to music making events. This pattern creates an experience of music making and islandness particular to Clare Island. Music making on Clare Island is primarily an indoor activity and tied to specific buildings, to specific rooms and to conventions of the built environment. In 2017, I examined the primary structures in Clare Island community life and calculated a total of 118 structures with habitation or social uses. This count excludes all sheds or industrial or agricultural units. Some 103 of these 118 buildings are domestic residences of some type. The remaining 15 are from the 118 are non-residential, but include important community structures such as the church, the school, the shop, here we have the shop, the two bars, the creche building, the health centre. As a whole, these, and, these 15 buildings form the backbone of state support, commerce, religious life and tourism on Clare Island. These, these, sorry, this 2017 figures reveal that the community of Clare Island operates within a small built infrastructure. Along with the physical environment of the island, these sites provide the, the figurative and literal stages for community and social activity. Within this infrastructure, there are four key sites for music making on the island. There's the Sailor's Bar and the public bar at the community centre, both located at the harbour. There's the National School and there's the Catholic Church. The most active of these spaces for music making in 2017 and throughout the start of the 21st century are the two public bars at the harbour. Both the bar at the Clare Island Community Centre and the Sailor's Bar provide open to all free musical entertainment during the summer and on other off-season off occasions. This is an image of the community centre bar, or the community centre building with the bar on the lower uh, right hand side of the building. The 12 months of 2017 characterised the previous five year period, and many of the events in this year were repetitions of previous years. In 2017, there were approximately 86 public events that included music as their focus or as a supporting aspect. The majority of these events took place between May and September in one of the two island bars. From 1st of June to the 3rd of September, there were 58 music events advertised on social media platforms and in the local Clare Island newsletter. This booking schedule is representative of the pattern of summer music making on Clare Island from maybe say from 2012 up until 2019. And of course, there's been nothing happening last year and this year will probably be quiet as well. From the perspective of music making and social activity, it is helpful to divide the annual cycle on Clare Island into two main blocks. There's a busy tourist season running from May to September and a quiet off season running from October to about April. The tourist season breaks down further into what you call, could describe as shoulder periods, the months of May and September and a high season, which goes from June until about August. The three month period from June to August is a tourist high season, but the six to seven weeks from the 1st of July are consistently the busiest with most events, and most music making taking place. While not all seasonal changes revolve around tourism, the increased seasonal amenities benefit locals and tourists alike. The entertainment and dining opportunities available in the tourist season add a layer of depth to local life absent in the off season. Over the winter, the bar only opens on particular days. Most of the tourist accommodation closes and there are no restaurant services available. This image I showed already is from July. And this is a busy night in July, whereas this is a busy night sometime in, I think this is in December, in the same venue. 
In the 21st century, tourism is a driving force for music making on the island. Seasonal tourism is in turn dependent on sea travel and influenced by seasonal changes of weather. Tourism patterns on Clare Island linked local tourism in County Mayo and patterns at a national level. For example, according to the Irish National Tourism Authority, Fault Ireland, County Mayo was the seventh most popular destination for international tourists and the sixth most popular destination for domestic trips in 2017. In this year alone, tourism generated some 186 million euro for the Mayo economy. In the 21st century, modern tourism has a significant impact on the island economy, but also extends beyond direct financial gains. This is most evident in the distinct tourist season and off season that marks social life and music making. Lilis O'Leary notes a similar seasonality on Tory Island, with the tendency for the island to be a much livelier place, Tory that is, in the summer than in the winter. He suggests that this is a seasonal reversal of the traditional time frame of, of island life in the past for Quote, when the economy was based on farming and fishing and the population was more stable, winter was the main rest period when lively socialising took place, end quote. This seasonal reversal is noted on other Irish and Scottish islands where tourism is an important strand of the local economy. In the second decade of the 21st century, summers on Clare Island are busier than any previous period in living memory. There are more tourists, more accommodation providers, more services, more passenger ferries, more scheduled events, more musicians traveling to the island. 1960, life on Clare Island has become increasingly shaped by the economic activities of tourism. Although this season pattern existed for some time, the explosion of tourist fo focused entertainment during the 21st century has impacted the balance of year round community based social life. One Islander describes this, the increased level of summer activity in recent years and the positive effect of social life and music making. Sorry, this is a quote here. I don't know if you can see the full, full quote, but uh, he says, the summers are really, really busy here. It's because there's lots of different types of music. Like in July and August, guaranteed four nights music every single week, maybe even seven nights a week sometimes, but guaranteed four nights. So there's a lot happening and a lot of quality stuff happening, be it the singer songwriter nights or be it the Kyol this night or the Fela Kyol or even the visiting bands that play on the weekend. So to wrap up this, this whirlwind tour of Clare Island and to conclude, and this is here an image of the Sailors Bar, the second main venue for music making on Clare Island. And I'll actually let this play with an image of the harbour area a drone shot showing you the harbour and a little, as I make my concluding comments. On Clare Island, the experience of island life or islandness is a set of defining limitations expressed through music making and social participation. The size of the resident population and the availability of tourist accommodation imposes an upper limit on audience numbers or participants. Consequently, it is possible to predict within a narrow range, approximate attendance at a community gathering or at a summer music making event. This pattern, or, this pattern or predictability extends across time through the general rhythm of seasonal activity and the limitations of the venues for music making. There are, of course, subtler examples of this pattern or predictability. For example, during the summer months, observing the evening ferry, which would land at the harbour here, looking at the evening ferry would indicate the possibility of music making as all musicians and instruments arrive through this single channel. Also, to a lesser degree, the annual return of certain music groups and audience familiarity with local and regional musicians creates a predictability in the expected quality of genre of performances. These defining limitations or patterns present the contours of islandness on Clare Island. Additionally, music making on the island reflects these contours as they change across time. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Rory, for that. Um... And yeah, a whistle stop tour of music making and place uh, and place making, perhaps even um, environments of music on Clare Island. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to um, I'd also like to just compliment the speakers on the timing of all of that, uh, which is exactly where we need to be. 
I'm going to go now to, um, I'm going to go first to um, uh, Dr. Annie, Annie Hanlon and um, to get her uh, response to kind of the, the three papers together, but also Annie may have individual um, questions as well. Um, and then we've a couple of questions in the chat as well. And if there's anybody else um, who wants to put questions in the chat, please feel free to do so. But I'd invite um, Annie now to contribute uh, and respond to the papers. Thanks so much, Maeve. Um, I'd just like to say well done to all three um, speakers there. Fascinating research happening, a real diversity of work in terms of topics and methodologies, but it's uh, clear that Irish music studies is thriving in Galway. Um, and I think one of the things that struck me about them was the, the confluence of methodologies in, in between popular music studies and Irish traditional music scholarship. I think really, especially as of late, we're seeing a, a breakdown between this these strict divides that have have, have really existed before, especially between maybe musicology and ethnomusicology. And um, I think as well of, of, of the recent work of Tess Leminski and how it, her work is uh, trying to bring the two together. And I see it, it's not just happening in her work, it's happening here as well in this in this recent research as well coming out of Galway. Um, and I find it very exciting. And I, I noted one of the questions even um, was taking uh, one of Michael's um, concepts and applying it to, um, to another paper uh, there. Um, I suppose, yeah, I, I really just have um, a couple of comments specific to, to the different papers. Um, firstly, I'll, I'll start with uh, Dr. Malachy, Malachy Egan's paper um, on Areda, which uh, was lovely to hear because, uh, uh, in fact, it was it was Maeve, Maeve Nair on there introduced me to Sean Areda all those many years ago in UCC. And um, so it's, it's funny, I feel like I'm coming full circle today. Um, and uh, it's, it's wonderful that he's, He's such um, a pivotal picture, figure in the history of Irish traditional music and the history of Irish art music. He straddles so many worlds, um, um, whether whether they were kind of more formal or informal world, music making worlds, um, from UCC to, to RGE to um, Coulé. Um, and um, I think um, I was I'm very excited there and interested to hear about Oreda and the concept album is something that you really associate with popular music studies again, but something that um, Dr. Egan is proposing that he has, he has done here in, in Irish for Irish traditional music. Um, and in a sense, uh, the LP, of course, played a big part in uh, that, that new technology coming through in the in the 50s and 60s played a role in in um, allowing for these these new kind of um, ways of thinking about music and how to how to promote it and uh, package it and 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 uh, perform it and give it to new audiences. And I suppose in terms of um, a question, I'd like to propose to to, um, to Malachi would be um, I'd like to ask you. Um, maybe you don't have to answer it right now. I'll finish all the comments and if you come back to this one, um, I'd like to ask you about the area of nostalgia and how this manifested itself in Oriada's music in either in the composition or the performance or its reception. Um, and are there particular recordings that you consider particularly nostalgic and why? And does this concept of nostalgia, um, is it linked to nationalism um, or is it more linked to a place? Or, you know, as in how do you conceptualize that idea of nostalgia? And I'm just wondering as well, um, is this expression of nostalgia very different from album to album or does he have kind of a, uh, vocabulary for for expressing nostalgia in his music and um i was just i just uh, another uh, a comment upon nostalgia is um just from from my own popular music studies a couple of years ago i came across this um and i'm, I'm very interested in, in the music of uh, of east germany popular music in east germany before the wall came down and um um, there's actually a film called Sun and Alley, which when it came out, that's like a, a big alley alley that runs through the middle of Berlin and the, the Berlin Wall was right in the middle of it. And um, so there's a film called Sun and Alley and, and this film was really um, cr critiqued very strongly when it came out because it um, it was said to be glorifying um, the, the East and glorifying, um, you know, it was the sunny days and it was the time when everybody had a job and everybody had healthcare. So it wasn't it wonderful. Socialism was wonderful, but a lot of people were saying, but it was also a terrible time when you had the Stasi and there were so many other things happening as in, and, and so they called it, while it was a form of nostalgia, it got a nickname as being called Ostalgi, which is like nostalgia for the East because it was so biased and it pre presented a very particular form of nostalgia that really didn't represent reality for a lot of people. And so I'm just wondering, um, as in, I just thought that that was maybe an interesting parallel that you could maybe um, uh, think about the political dimension of nostalgia as well and how maybe that manifests itself in the music of Arrieta. Um, 
Right, and so on to uh, Dr. Michael Leiden's paper um, on on noise. I think this is a a very interesting paper because it's um, it really transcends the boundaries of genre. In that, here you're considering noise as popular music, but it could just as easily be considered noise as Irish traditional music. Um, it's you know looking at um, something that really is overlooked, which is the fact that noise is also a form of cultural expression and it can be judged and valued just as we value music. Um, so I think I think that's a it's a really important um, concept to, to explore here. And it's it's um, it's a very, very uh, rich idea that that's hopefully will have a lot of ramifications in in Irish music studies, um, particularly. And I, I love the comment about how it's really, you know, in this digital age of, you know, control V, control C or delete um, the fact that there it's an aesthetic choice is being made here, you know, to leave in the noise. Um, it, it could easily be removed from recordings. And the fact that it's not being removed means we cannot simply dismiss it as noise in the traditional sense of the word noise. Um, and um, and so he, he argues rightly so that noise is part of our um, intangible cultural heritage. Um, and um, I, um, yeah, and I thought that the idea of considering noise as sounding as a verb um, is 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 a very um, exciting um, uh, idea as well to take to take into it, um, and so yeah, and so it's it's also he's highlighting here that sound is an important practice within the repertoire of Irish popular musicians, and I wonder is that the same for Irish traditional musicians? It may also be um, argued there. Um, so I just wanted to uh, leave Michael with a question as well. So noise has an aesthetic dimension too. It's it's often a very personalized decision as to what to keep in and keep out. You mentioned there, of course, the recordist has that control, but I'm sure the artist would have that control too. And I'm just wondering is what are the potential methodological difficulties of studying or analyzing noise's ability to sound Ireland? Um, how do you keep that um, analysis specific to the Irish uh, context, for example? Uh, right, so thanks, Michael. And on to um, Rory's paper on music making. Um, I think that this paper was fascinating, especially in the context of the current time when you see just how important these snapshots of, of, um, of these kind of ethnographic studies are, a snapshot in time um, of, my God, already it's a bygone time and it's only 2017 at the moment. Hopefully it's only temporarily bygone, but um, it just shows that like, um, uh, the, yeah, as in how important these communal music making activities are, and um, um, uh, yeah, even um, it, it's brilliant to have this snapshot pre, and even then to to um, I follow. I was just thinking myself, if, if if I were you, I'd be very interested in talking to people about what what the lack of that sudden music making has. We just seem to have. Hello, have you lost me? We've lost you. You're frozen, but we do have sound now. Okay, shall I turn off my camera or are we on my back? Uh, you seem to be back, yeah. Okay, in full travel, so. I'm nearly yeah. done, I'm nearly done. <laughs> it's a zoom in, give me a hint to uh, area up Keep here. going. Um, uh, yeah, so I just, I suppose, um, yeah, I think the, the this study of music making really uh, on Clare Island in 2017 demonstrates really the importance of environment on the social process of music making. And it's this applies to all genres, but it's really, um, it's it's really wonderfully brought home in relation to the three environmental factors that um, that Rory points out here of C and C's in the built environment and human population, um, and I think it's a it's a it's a really rich piece of work and um, also it really just hammers home the importance of music making in this kind of in in, in within Irish culture but specifically within island culture and. Um, uh, yeah, and, and I love the fact that the concept of musicking even extended here really to the ferry as well, bringing musicians over. I, I just wanted to ask um, Rory about, um, have you found that um, you mentioned islandness has defined limitations? I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Um, that would be fantastic. And I'm wondering as well, are those limitations different depending on which island you're on in the West Coast? Or is it unfair to even try and make um, comparisons between the different islands on the West Coast? Um, yeah, just speaking from someone who I know quite a lot about Tory Island, it's from near where I'm from and uh, I've been there a lot and experienced the music making on Tory Island and it's it's something to behold. Um, I'm just, uh, yeah, so that's my question for you really about islandness and its limitations. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's all I've got to say for now. Thank you so much. Everyone really enjoyed your works and and, and looking, looking forward to hearing the answers to my questions. Yeah.
Thanks very much, um, Annie. Um, we might um, we might kind of work our way backwards because there's a couple of questions that we'll gather up on the way then as well. So, Rory, I might go to you first, actually, just um, to talk a little bit about islandness and um, and limitations. Okay. Um, let's see. What can I say at this moment in time? Uh, I an island is is inherently a limited space and. I was just trying to apply that to how the limitations of each island shape shape differently, like the cultural life and music making. So I would say those sets of limitations are, are definitely dependent on the individual island, if that was the question you were asking. Um, hmm. from in, in my work, it is a way of identifying what sets Clare, Clare Island, the community on Clare Island, What's, what makes their experience particular and also universal to other islands are, are like, if not universal, at least similar to other Irish near shore islands. Um, and the frameworks that I propose were the, the way that I saw the limitations expressed. So, you know, the, the distance from the mainland, that's, in, that's, that's part of the whole thing with sea travel, like how far it is, how, how, um, how easy it is to land on the mainland but then also what what structures are available within the community and different islands will have different different venues like some islands will have arts centers and more you know public bars and you know then the the population size like a, a population of 500 people has a very different uh, set of resources than a population of 150 or, or population of 80 so those limitations definitely are particular to each island and that's I, I don't know if that answers your question I hope maybe I don't uh, know yeah, yeah I was just wondering as well what were the limitations you found on Clare Island specifically that that uh, you discovered through your research yeah well that's in terms of the the size the, the, size, the, yeah. the, re, the, re, the built uh, infrastructure and the, the population and then the sea but uh, okay and the sea yeah. All right. fantastic thank you uh, um, um, Michael, we might go to you um, now in responding to Annie's question about um, uh, uh, about noise and particularly um, uh, the context of noise in this, you know, in a in a digital age, as it were, as well. And, and um, I think Annie as well, even though it wasn't a specific question, that idea of noise and this came up actually in one of the questions we got as well. Um, that idea of the idea of noise being applicable across kind of uh, across genres and especially so in Ireland um, so I'm not sure if you have time to answer all of that but address some of us there at least. Yeah I was thinking about Nula's question actually thank you for the question Nula and actually Dan also um, had a question too where he was looking at uh, Ian Malini's book and Ian also talks about some of the stuff I'm, I'm, I, I look at my work What's interesting, I think, with the, the genre one is less the genres and the artists I was expecting to find noise. I didn't find noise. If that makes sense. I was expecting to find this in someone like uh, Lisa Hannigan, uh, you know, perhaps somebody from a more folk element. I was expecting it to find there, but I didn't find it. But then I found it in someone, an in, in artist like Republic of Loose, you know, something in a kind of a mixture of blues, hip hop, you know, you know, kind of a, a middle, you know, a middle kind of, you know, an undefinable group, if you will, in terms of genre. So I think that was one of the more interesting aspects of it. And you mentioned about the idea of sounding Ireland in that too, or how, um, how that relates to it. Really what's important with noise, and you mentioned the idea of actually choice being the key factor, and choice is the key. You really, the idea of who chooses to leave this here, why is it there? I always say to anyone who asks me, well, you know, why am I researching? I always go back to the very beginning of Jeff Buckley's Hallelujah, and I always question, why did they leave that bell to start of Hallelujah, where he goes, why is that there? Why is that breath there? What's that supposed to say? What's that supposed to communicate? And in the same way with all these artists that I examine, why is this little clink of a glass left there? What's it trying to say? It's, it's clearly there for a reason, because as I said, with uh, Krukowski's work, you can point to it with your mouse and remove it. It's not that difficult. So in some ways, using noise, how they're using it and how I'm interpreting that to signal sound Ireland is also it's, I suppose, my use, but in some ways too, and someone like Damien Dempsey is quite clear. Uh, one song in particular, Marching Seas and Seas, he uses a rounded, distorted version of um, 
uh, Land of Hope and Glory, which kind of sounds like this warbling effect at the start of a song. But if you play it back and listen to it in the context of the song, it's clearly meant to signal to sound Ireland because it's almost, you know, if you look at Irish studies in general, you know, Kybert's assessment that, uh, you know, what is Irish only only on the reversion of uh, uh, English identity. So the idea of reverting what he does is that with land, hope and glory. So it clearly serves a purpose and that's really what's there. And I suppose that's what I find uh, interesting in terms of, but again, it's the fluidity of noise that of course it can sound nat national identity, but it can also sound anything else. It can be uh, serve as a punctuation mark at the end. It can, it can um, serve as a, um, a little bit of, um, you know, kind of use it quite a bit for humor. She used an awful lot of, you know, she used the laughter at the end of a song, VIP, which is a sort of a self-reflection on her own kind of career, which is, which is quite interesting. So again, there's all these different ways, but it doesn't necessarily relate to one. That may not have answered the question, but I hope it did. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, it's yeah. fantastic. You're really saying that it, it, it does have meaning and it signifies. Mm. Just, yeah, and, and you've just given so many examples of that. Yeah, absolutely. But it, you're right, it's something we mm. need to consider and not just ignore as noise or just dismiss as noise, you know? Yeah, it's mm. fascinating stuff. Um, yeah, was, sorry, Michael, go ahead. I will say it is frustrating that once you hear it, it's very hard not to hear it. <laughs> so it's <laughs> hard to then turn it off. So you suddenly go, huh. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I suppose there's another question, uh, or um, and this is a comment rather than a question, and that is on the, you know, in the considerations of music making writ large, then is noise, you know, one tool amongst the suite of sounds that are available, right? Uh, and so then where is the line between noise and music? you know, uh, like mm, yeah. that, that it's actually under an umbrella somehow or another mm. of music making and that, that that's one just, you know, it's one utensil, as it were, um, available mm. and, and one that's used more often maybe than, um, you know, which you've identified much more often than we perhaps realise, you know, mm. uh, and, and quite intentionally. So mm. it's the intentionality, which is key, I think, uh, as you've Absolutely. identified. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, uh, I'm working my way back uh, to Maliki now, and um, we have a couple of different questions in. Um, uh, but if you if you wanted to speak to Annie's comments first of all, Maliki. Yeah, thanks very much, Annie, for all your, your comments there and, and questions. Just uh, I know your main question was around nostalgia uh, and, and the examples of that and how you approach that within Oreda's work. Uh, I think. When I set out at looking at Horeda, you know, that was one question I was looking at, you know, those, that first slide I put up there about some of the different, you know, environment and music. Nostalgia was one thing that I had in my mind at trying to review whether these can be examples or whether you can find examples of that. Uh, at early stages, if you just quickly review the album, you may think you see references to nostalgia. I would argue after in-depth analysis of all the albums, really nostalgia can really be found uh, in Flat Hole and Radio the Radio series and Ding Dong, which are both linked. That was where I would clarify Oriel's nostalgia towards his own youth. Uh, it, you know, you can just tell between the repertoire, the production of the album and the radio series uh, is very, you know, you do get that sense of nostalgic looking back at his youth, the type of songs, traditions uh, and music that he would have experienced as a child. What you see in, in the other albums, uh, what you see in Rock Ritz and Reilly, the radio series and the album, uh, what you obviously see in Kjol and Lucil, uh, I would argue is much more his, historical in nature. Uh, Oreza's radio series, or, or Musical Heritage, uh, very much was about addressing what he felt was historic in, historical inaccuracies in terms of the performance of Irish instrumental music, uh, vocal song and then of course uh, ensemble performance and you really see that these albums were somehow addressing some of those issues I wouldn't classify them as nostalgic in nature I would really classify Ding Dong and Flacco on radio as more nostalgic in nature uh, in terms of the political aspect uh, again I suppose it's interesting to view it through that prism as well you know Oreda's approach to political emphasis of political interpretations of Irish traditional music and song are probably most evident in our musical heritage radio series, which is predominantly a, a lecture series. Uh, you know, there are aspects of that you can listen over and over again, particularly to the final section of our musical heritage. You can listen to Aurelia's closing statement uh, and you, you can listen, you can recognize aspects that you can really compare to Douglas Hyde's 
the necessity to, to the angle side, you know, that's that speech. Uh, and that's where you would see that. But in terms of your overall, I'm not sure whether I even answered the question, but uh, in terms of finding nostalgia, I would really link it with the latter stages of the group's performance history, huh. particularly with Ding Dong and Flacco and Razio. I would view the other earlier aspects more in a historical and a correct, historic corrective nature, if that makes sense, in that he was addressing some of the issues he put forward. Uh, and it wasn't, I wouldn't, I, I, you know, I would class it as nostalgic in nature in that sense. Uh, Another point which probably mirrors, and I know Dolby uh, had, had some questions there in the quest, question and answer section uh, about uh, Oriza's substitution uh, of the piano uh, in the that Kyoto Kuro was somehow another form of the Kelly band. You know, I would, uh, I would absolutely love to hear Oriza's response to the idea that Kyoto Kuro was a different for formation of the Kelly band. Uh, purely based on his own criticisms of the Cayley band model uh, during our musical heritage. Uh, Dobby's question focuses on, you know, he, he mentioned substitution twice, you know, the, the substitution of the harpsichord for the piano, the substitution of uh, Sean O'Shea in the place of Dark Khan. Uh, I wouldn't use the word substitution because Oria, I and mean, I, I tried to put that forward when I, when I was talking, uh, but Oriza's use of Kyoto Raccoon is very much as a tool. And that's what my own PhD research discovered. That, you know, even throughout all the projects Oriza is involved in, it's Sean Oriza and Kyoto and it's Sean Oriza and Kyoto Raccoon, and Sean Oriza, Kyoto Raccoon, and Sean O'Shea in particular settings. He is using Kyoto Raccoon as a, as a tool to address certain themes and certain issues he's trying to address. So in his substitution of the harpsichord, for instance, yes, there, there is criticism about the substitution of the harpsichord, but there is evidence, if you look at what he's writing about at that time, particularly in the Irish Times, he writes at one stage in experimenting with what he would classify as the modern harp versus the old Irish harp, which he is trying to replicate and which he feels cannot be replicated. And he's replicating it with the harpsichord, which again is an historical accurate representation as well, if you think of the rock period uh, and the, the sound that he is trying to portray through Kyoto Rikun as well. Uh, as well as that, uh, I would argue that Sean O'Shea's substitution for Darren Cahan, again, Darren Cahan is in uh, Rock with Unread, the radio series, and Rock with Unread, the, the album. But Flacchio and Radio with Sean O'Shea is broadcast during the same time. They're not mutually exclusive radio series. He's actually broadcasting these series during the same period throughout the course of the 1960s. So it's not a case, I would argue, of substitution, but rather it is using the singers and Kyoto Kulin to address different issues. You know, Rock with Unread was very much about focusing on that idea of Gaelic Ireland. Uh, and recitations and channel scene, whereas Flacco on radio was again focusing on nostalgia, was very much focused on the type of music and song that would be associated with Oriza's um, youth. So again, I would say when you're looking, you know, to view Kyoto Kulin as simply as a conventional commercial group skews completely your how you evaluate the group uh, throughout the course of the 1960s. And by, if you look at the history of the development of the group, which I've done in my own thesis, you, you, um, what emerges is a completely different way of evaluating what took place during the course of the 1960s. And what, what the history tells you and what happened tells you is that Kyoto Rikuru were part of a much wider process being engaged in by Sean Reza. Uh, and to classify it as one commercial band unit and to whether it's criticized or to make commentary on that basis isn't historically accurate and I, I hope that makes sense but I think that approach for me personally from going into this trying to answer questions that I had no answers for and then coming out the end with a completely different perspective simply based on the historical evaluation and the historical development of Kyoto Rikuru and then evaluate Oops. Uh, Maliki, I think we've, uh, you've just frozen there. Um, I, you'll come back in, hopefully. Yeah. Um, Sorry, no, my, my connection froze there. That's okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm conscious of time and um, I'm also conscious that there, uh, you know, maybe other questions which people, um, uh, I'm just going to look at the last of my thesis clarifications. Uh, and I, and I guess to what's, uh, you know, what's part of this is, I mean, what you're really investigating Maliki is the, 
is uh, is is Oriada's again actually this the word that I've already used is this kind of intentionality right so what you know what are his intentions does he deliver on those intentions but also then how are they received so in you know in taking Davi's comments on board like how are they received and of course they're not received uniformly uh, with great adulation by any means. Um, uh, I'm conscious of the time and I'm going to uh, wrap things up and in so doing um, uh, I just first of all I'd actually like to just announce that our next seminar uh, will be on the 26th of May at 4 p.m. again um, and this time we have um, Kelly Nora Drucker from uh, Concordia University uh, in Montreal who will be a visiting scholar actually here next year and she is presenting on Naming the Traces, Reconstructing an Irish Canadian Family Narrative of Emigration, Placemaking and Return. Um, so it falls to me now to thank, uh, first of all, our uh, respondent, Annie Hanlon. Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, great great, great to have you involved. Any excuse uh, to get Annie, uh, do anything for us. We jump at the opportunity um, <laughs> at the centre and are always um, delighted and provoked by what you have to say um, in equal measure, perhaps. I'd like to thank all of the um, people who attended today. Uh, thanks to David for uh, the steady hand on the L webinar. And uh, thanks to Nessa Cronin, who organises these and indeed then, and most of all, thank you to um, doctors, Maliki Egan, um, Rory McCabe and Michael Lydon. And I suppose I would just like to say um, that uh, if, just from a personal note, uh, one of the big disappointments for me was not being able to be at a graduation for any of these students. Um, so, um, I, you know, I'd just like to congratulate you all publicly in this format uh, for the wonderful research, for the delivery of your PhD thesis during COVID. Let's yeah. not forget the challenges of that. And you're to be commended and commended for your work today as well. So thank you to you all. And thank you to everybody who attended. Good luck. Uh, it is a bit cold out, but it is a fine day. So at least we can get outside. And thank, thank you, Maeve. And I, I just wanted to say congratulations as well to the to the three guys on getting their PhDs this year and to you, Maeve, as a supervisor as well. Three PhDs in one year. That's impressive. <laughs> well done, all thank of you. you. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for having me. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.